Welcome back from the break. I hope you managed to get something to drink and perhaps stretch your legs. Okay, so let's have a look at how we interpret phylogenetic tree. Okay, so we've looked at our concept map again. We had a look at the key biological concepts. Um, we've had a look at what the terms mean, um, which are very important so that we understand the rest. And now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how we interpret uh, a phylogenetic tree. All right, so basically we said a phylogenetic tree indicates which ancestors gave rise to which descendants. Okay, so it's very important and it's very much like a family tree, uh, a phylogenetic tree, but there we include um, all sorts of organisms um, and we can go back millions and millions and millions of years um, and even billions of years to see uh, even back to where life first began. So a phylogenetic tree um, is like a tree. So we start at the bottom, usually at the base, at the roots, and then we move up the stem, and then as the branches, as it branches off, so the species or speciation occurs, and then we, we end up with different species. And we end up with the biodiversity that we know today. All right, so let's have a look. Okay, to help interpret this and any other phylogenetic tree, because interpreting phylogenetic trees or diagrams is actually a skill. And once you've learned this skill, it doesn't matter which diagram they give you in the exams, um, you know, you would be able to, so it wouldn't really matter what uh, question you are given, what example you are given. If you've learned the skill, then you should be able to answer the question. So that's why it's very important to master the skill of interpreting phylogenetic trees. Okay, so let's have a look at how we're going to do it. So they say to us, use the following pointers. So the first thing is we look at the root of the phylogenetic diagram, and that represents the ancestor. So if we have a look at this diagram over here, we can see this is the root, okay? There we have the ancestor. And if we have a look at the, um, the arrow and the time scale on the side, yeah, we can see we start at the past and we move up towards the more recent um, time. Okay, so that's the root. Um, and then the branches, those are the descendants um, of that ancestor. So they, in other words, came from that ancestor. So as we have a look here, we saw the ancestor and the tree kind of branches out over here, and it gives rise to two new ancestors, uh, descendants. All right, so, and these descendants then, further speciation can take place, and we have more descendants forming each time. So when we have a look at um, the common ancestor, so if we have a look at this, we say the common ancestor, he, this person, or this individual, this organism, was the common ancestor of all of them. However, um, if I say this one here is also a common ancestor, but it's now no longer the common ancestor of species one, okay, because it's now um, branched off. So that now becomes the common ancestor of species two, three, and four. If I go to this point over here, and I have a look at the common ancestor, again, it's now no longer the common ancestor of one and two, but it is the common ancestor of three and four. Okay, so that's how we have a look at, uh, or we start looking at an ancestor, for example. Okay, so, and when we move upwards um, in the phylogenetic tree, it basically means we are moving forward in time. So we are moving to more towards the present. All right, so now um, we spoke of it, or we had a look at the, the common ancestor, and we had a look at the roots and where um, the, the other species branch off, but now we're going to have a look at speciation. Okay, and we've done, we covered speciation in previous lessons where we saw that when uh, a, a population is split into two, and over time they change through natural selection 
and then become new species. So, so basically what we're doing here is we're having a look. Here's our ancestral lineage. So that's the ancestor. And then something happens here. And we call that a speciation event. And that speciation event caused, for some reason, the, this ancestral lineage was split into two groups. Okay, so they were split and they are either by a geographic barrier or some kind of reproductive isolating uh, mechanism. And that caused two new daughter lineages. So here we see we've now got two new lines. And over time, because this is time, if we move from the bottom to the top, then we're going from the past and, we find, and we're moving towards the more recent times. Um, and we find that then possibly as we get to the recent times, we would have now two different species. So this would be one and this would be two. Okay, so we could see that they have changed. All right, so speciation is represented as branching of the tree. So a single ancestral population or lineage gives rise to two or sometimes more daughter lines, depending on the, the separation or the speciation event that took place. Okay, so we've had a look at the ancestral population um, and we've seen you know, which, where, how we can have a look and find the common ancestor of various species on our phylogenetic tree. We also had a look and we saw that um, where they actually split, that is caused by what we call speciation events. And we did study speciation in previous lessons, so we know that is where organisms or a population is split into two groups, either by a physical barrier um, a geographic barrier, or just simply that the organisms become reproductively isolated. And we, we also study those uh, mechanisms. So it can either be that they reproduce at different times of the year, or there's courtship behaviors, or whatever. Okay, so let's now have a look at um, what each lineage tells us. Okay, so each lineage has a part of its own history that is unique and parts that are shared with other lineages. Okay, and that's, uh, so let's have a look here. So we can see here, um, here's our common ancestor, would be here, here's our ancestor, and um, they all share, okay, they all share the common ancestor, so this one here. But as we move up here is a speciation event, so that's where speciation occurred, and we had the formation of species A and B. Okay, so we had A and B forming there. However, as we have a look at this daughter lineage here, we see that there's another speciation event that took place. Okay, so there we can see there's another speciation event that took place. So now we don't only have species A and B, but we also have species C. So let's have a look at what is unique to each and what is shared history. Okay, so if we have a look at the red line here, that is unique history to A. Okay, um, the dotted line here would be shared history of B and C. So in other words, they have a shared history. Um, and, and then what is unique to B would be what's in green and, and, and what is unique to C is what is in blue. Okay, so as we said, some lineages, there's unique history and some there is shared history. All right. Um, okay, so now each lineage has ancestors. Okay, so we already um, established that, that are unique. And then common ancestors that are shared with other lineages. So they have some that are just belong to them and then some that are unique. So if we have a look at the diagram here, again here we have this one is the common ancestor of A, B and C. So in other words, this was the, the, where the speciation event took place and that common ancestor was divided into two groups. Okay, so they split 
and we ended up with species A, and over here we had the development of another species, and then we see that there was another speciation event, and that common ancestor now was, or the, the species, that second group there was divided into two, and they then became species B and species C. So what is the common ancestor then of species C? So it wouldn't be here. So this is, would be the common ancestor of all three, A, B, and C. This one is the common ancestor of B and C because it's on this line. It's no longer linked to species A. And then this one here would be the common ancestor only of C because this line is no longer linked to species B. Okay. Right, now let's have a look at this diagram. This is an example, um, and it's a simplified summary of the history of hominids. And basically what we have a look here, it's a very nice diagram because we can see there's a common ancestor. We see there are descendants. This is our timeline. So it starts off at 5 million years ago and it moves forward um, to, to the present, where we are now. And then we have a look here and we can see, so we've got a lineage that then splits into two um, and then there's another speciation event there that happens and so we get two new uh, groups and then we have changes and another speciation event and there's another branching off there. All right, and then we can also have a look at extinction um, that has taken place because some of the, you can see some of the Organisms don't go all the way to the present. Okay, so let's have a look at, at, the, at the specifics. Okay, so the diagram, in the diagram above, we can see um, Australopith Australopithecus afarensis. Okay, so there's Australopithecus afarensis, and they are the common ancestor of Homo habilis and uh, Australopithecus robustus. Um, Okay, so, so that line there splits, and there, that's where Australopithecus afarensis is now the common ancestor of the two new groups. Okay, when the line forks or branches, so where it splits, um, speciation takes place, and new species originate. Okay, so there Australopithecus, we see there's a branching, um, and they then you know, branched into Homo habilis and Australopithecus robustus. Right, the organisms that existed when the line forked into branches is the common ancestor of that new species. So that is why we say Australopithecus is the uh, common ancestor to these two here. All right, when a line ends, it is the extinction of that specific species. Okay, and, we, and if you have a look, you can have a look um, in the DBE textbook, it explains it very nicely. And here what we see is that, um, for example, Homo robustus, let me just clear that and get it a little bit closer. Um, we can see the line, let's try and draw a line better. Okay, so where they end, so they didn't make it all the way to present time. So that species then has become extinct. Okay, so we can have a look at the timeline at the bottom. So it would be either on the x-axis or the y-axis, and we can then determine how old an organism is. So these are the kind of questions you would be asked. So for example here, Homo habilis, so let's have a look at where this speciation event occurred, and it's around about 3 million years ago. So you can be asked various questions. You can be asked about the descendants. So here is this common ancestor A would be the common ancestor of chimpanzees as well as Australopithecus afarensis, and in fact all of them, because this is before the branch split into any of these branches. Okay, and they would then, the rest, these two, then are known as the descendants. So the two branches then are the descendants. Um, okay, and then we can have a look, so they can say what occurred here, what occurred there, um, what occurred here, 
and those would be your speciation events. Okay, so all of these, um, this is what we can actually pick up from uh, a phylogenetic tree. And that's why I say um, it's very important that we are able to interpret a phylogenetic tree and we, we learn the skill. So it's very simple. We find at the root of your phylogenetic tree we have the um, common ancestor. Then some kind of speciation event occurred that actually split that population into two. And when that was split into two, we had the formation of new species. So we get new daughter lineages. Okay, and those daughter lineages, each time there's a speciation event that takes place and causes a fork in the branch um, and they split into two, then we get new formation of new species. And this is how we can actually work out then how related organisms are. Um, and as we go up the lineage or the line or the tree, we find common ancestors of organisms, but they might not be um, common to all the organisms in that phylogenetic tree. But they would then be common to certain of the organisms. And then we also saw that there's certain history that is unique to specific species and then history that is common to all the species. Okay, so um, that's basically um, our interpretation of a phylogenetic tree. Okay, so we've come to the end of that segment and I'm sure you guys are a little bit tired. We've been talking and we've looked at a lot of concepts. Um, so we're going to take a short break. We'll see you after that. Thank you.